Saddleworth Moor became indelibly linked with crimes which repulsed post-war Britain. Volunteers searched for the bodies of children murdered and then buried by Hindley and her lover Ian Brady. Seeing the pictures of the two that were involved in killing these children, it struck fear into me. His eyes, he has evil eyes. The victims would beg to be freed. He was absolutely possessed by a need to create pain. He was always going to kill. I have never been able to understand why a human being takes the life of another. The misconception of Brady is that he is evil, but Ian Brady was ill. If you're looking for deep psychiatric reasons, no one has yet come up with them. And that's one of the horrifying paradoxes of the whole case. Brady's crimes are a window into his mind. None of this explains why he goes to the heart of darkness. I wouldn't call him a man. I wouldn't. No, a monster. When it comes to Ian Brady, genetics loaded the gun. His personality aimed it, and Myra pulled the trigger. Do you think the papers ought to publish such full accounts of the Moore's murder trial? As it's such a horrible thing, it shouldn't be publicised to such a great extent. Until after the actual trial, you know. Well, I, I think they just uh, interest people in uh, reading more or less pornographic literature. That, that's the bad, bad effect. The, on the good side, it, it does show that some shocking things are going on. Really evil he was. That's it, a friend of his was He rang him. the police. Yeah, in the end, yeah. Because it went on too much. His time when he was about 13. Well, he was going to kill that poor lad who was a homosexual. He killed him. And the other lad saw it done. That's what David. We, yeah. David. That's it. Hey, believe me, I sold him a bed. Did you? <laughs> the bed mad me. <laughs> there you are, you see. Sold him my bed. Yeah. Fantastic security precautions have been taken and the precincts of the court have been very widely defined. Before you can get into the court, you have to produce no less than three passes if you're a mere journalist. The dock, semicircular, with a shield of half-inch thick plate glass behind it, the two accused were put up in the dock. Brady wearing a light grey suit and a blue tie, Hindley wearing a sort of grey pepper and salt costume and a light blue open-necked shirt. If Ian hadn't got caught, he would have carried on. These were almost like experiments for him. He was trying different methods, different age groups. His crimes were a way to boost his own ego and to show how powerful he was. So he was needing to up the ante with each one to really build that ego and to feed his audience as well. In October 1963, Brady meets Maureen Henley's boyfriend, David Smith, a local tearaway. He'd been dragged up and he ran loose on the streets of Manchester from a very early age. There was no care and love in his life. He was 16 when he married Myra's sister, Maureen. And he married her because she was pregnant, but they did seem to make some sort of a go of it. And because of that, he met Ian Brady. David lives with his family. 
at 9 Wall Street, which is next door but one to Pauline Reed's family. In 1964, Henley and her gran move into 16 Wardabrook Avenue, and Brady moves in with them. Maureen Henley was seven months pregnant, and Henley and Brady invite them for a celebration. They spent a lot of time discussing these brilliant bank robberies and insurance heists they were going to carry out. And I think David Smith was well up for that. And I think Ian Brady, having had relatively easy success in getting another cult member in Myra Hindley, thought he could carry on and get more people involved in this. And David Smith was an obvious example. He is given books to read by Brady, and he's asked to write things out by Brady. Myra Hindley says she used to go to bed and leave Ian Brady and David Smith together, just talking. He talked to David Smith about killing, about the fact that they'd buried bodies on the moor. But I don't think David Smith even really particularly believed him. He just thought he's a fantasist. They must have thought if they drew David Smith into the plot with them, it would give them some kind of validity, uh, justification for what they were doing. But I think that in itself illustrates the madness that they succumb to. It's the madness of thinking what we're doing is normal and rational and we get somebody else to join in with. I think they wanted to introduce them into the cult. They wanted him to share in it, and that was their fatal mistake. Brady and Hindley are smartly dressed for a night out, and David watches them drive off towards the city centre. That evening, Brady goes to the central station and encounters 17-year-old Edward Evans. Brady invites Edward back to the house for a drink and he goes. Ian Brady had hatched a plan with his brother-in-law, David Smith, a way to make money so that Smith could make his rent and wouldn't be evicted. The plan was to go into central Manchester, lure a gay man back to the house at Waterbrook Avenue, then beat him and rob him. They were predators and they were discussing that fantasy. But this one with Edward was totally different. We know that it was in this area that Ian Brady met Edward Evans before Myra Hindley drove them home to Waterbrook Avenue. After arriving at Waterbrook Avenue, Ian Brady poured Edward Evans a drink. The plan was that Myra would go and get her brother-in-law, David Smith. Upon returning to Waterbrook Avenue, Myra told her brother-in-law to wait outside. She would flash the lights on and off when she wanted him to come in. David Smith waited patiently, and within due time, the living room lights flashed on and off. After following Hindley indoors, David hears a scream and rushes into the sitting room and sees Brady striking Edward with an axe. Edward Evans is the kind of forgotten Moore's victim. He's 17, he's physically fully grown and he's a man, so killing him is very different from killing a 10-year-old, 12-year-old child. After several blows with the hatchet, Edward Evans was dead. David sees that he's killed him and is terrified, and he helps Brady and Henley clean up the house. Ian looked at me and said, give us a lift with this mess. I was frightened, and I did what he said, and I helped to clean the mess up. I was wiping the blood off the walls and floor. Myra came in with a white bedsheet and a lot of pieces of polythene. Then Myra and Ian laid the blanket, sheet and pieces of polythene out on the floor. Then Ian told me to get hold of the lad's legs, which I did, and Ian got hold of the lad's shoulders. We lifted him and between us we carried the young lad upstairs into Myra's bedroom. David Smith returned home to his wife, Maureen. Upon his return home, he was covered in blood. I couldn't get to sleep. I kept thinking about the lad. 
I got up after a bit and put the light on, woke Maureen up, and I told her I had something terrible to tell her. Asking him what happened, he told her. They've killed someone. Who? Myra and Ian. They've killed a lad. Maureen didn't believe what she was hearing at first, but upon seeing how shaken David Smith was, seeing the blood on his clothes, Maureen and David decided to go to the police. I expected Ian and Myra to be outside my flat in their car, waiting for me to do something. I was frightened of leaving the place. It got to about six o'clock. We decided it was the best time to go about, so I armed myself with a carving knife and a screwdriver in case I met Ian and Myra. At sunrise, David and Maureen telephoned the police from a nearby phone box. I was um, in the CID at Hyde. Hyde is the nearest town to Huttersley, which was part of the suburbs of Hyde itself. I got to the police station about just gone seven in the morning, a bit busier than normal. It wasn't a very big station. And I said, what's up? They said, we've got a lad here that's it's in the parade room. Says he's witnessed a murder last night. David tells his story to the police and detectives are dispatched to the house. David Smith's basic story was that he had been called to his sister-in-law's house and whilst there, a man had committed murder uh, of a young man whom he didn't know. They were still there and they had gone to the house. A policeman, dressed up as a bread delivery man, knocked on the door of Waterbrook Avenue. Myra Hindley instantly opened the door and said, you've got the wrong house, we have sun blessed. At which point Myra was pushed aside and the police entered the house. We went upstairs and in the bedroom we found the trussed up body of Edward Evans. He was in a fetal position, tied up uh, in a plastic bag covered with some clothes. Brady was arrested, but Hindley remains free, although she was interviewed at the police station. He was charged with the murder of Edward Evans. When Smith had initially been interviewed, he had mentioned that Brady and Hindley used to frequent Manchester. Where about Manchester they frequent, various places, and then he mentioned that. They did go to railway stations. Smith had said a Brady had put stuff in, but to be found, initially asked Manchester City Police to set the red left luggage offices to find the suitcases. We opened them up. They were full of audio tapes and numb, hundreds of photos. And I found a photograph of a little girl. And she had a scarf tied round about her mouth, and she was naked. At that time, there were a number of children who were missing. And certainly in the Manchester area, and I think all over the country, there was no uh, national record kept of people who were missing from home. One of the people who were missing was a lad called John Copride. He was from Ashton on the line. He was missing. Search for the Mars was happening. But Lynx County were just about to close their inquiry down their um, search of the moors down, because they'd been all over that area and found nothing. They'd all just got on the bus to leave the moors, and there was one lad there, a lad called Bob Spears. He saw what she thought was a bone sticking out of the ground. Luck, chance, but like everything else, you've got to be there to have your luck to find. And they searched that area, and that uh, was the body of Leslie and Downey. Because we had found the body of Leslie Ann, there was a photograph of Leslie Ann. There was a tape recorder of Leslie Ann. And I fell upon a lad called Mike Mishida, who at the time was a photographer in scenes of crime at uh, Ashton Delight. He looked at some of the photographs, and there is a particular photograph of Myra Henley with a dog. And when you look at the photograph, in the first instance, you think she's looking at the dog. Um, 
But if you look at it closely, she's not looking at the dog. She and I should fight is looking at the area beyond the dogs. They were able to find the spot where this photograph was taken and found the body of John Cobright. You remember when Eden Brady? Yeah. I've only heard his name on, on the murder. Uh, on the uh, radio? On the case, on the case, yeah. Television and that? Yeah. So what year would that be? I think it was, see, I only heard about it in 63 when it was all going down on yeah. Hattersley. And it was Wardlebrook Avenue. Right. But we only heard about it when that lad ran for the police. And then it all came out about Brady and uh, Aaron Brady. In April 1966, in court two of the Chester Assizes, Ian Brady fought for his liberty in the face of three murder charges. In Liam Brady appeared at Chester Assizes Court. Ian Brady charged with three murders, Myra Hindley charged with two, and for assisting an offender. After he was arrested and was awaiting trial, a very prominent psychiatrist called Lindsay Neustatter went to visit him in prison on remand. And he came out shaking his head saying, I can't find anything wrong with him. Psychiatrists who talked to Myra Hindley came back with the same disturbing conclusion. They couldn't find anything wrong with her, which led you to the horrific conclusion that either they're as sane as we are or we're as insane as they are. It led to an enormous amount of head shaking as to what the truth was. What you're left with is that conventional psychiatric theories cannot account for why Hindley and Brady became what they are. During the trial, Ian Brady tried to minimise Mara Hindley's involvement in the crimes. But in the end, they were bonded in murder. Brady was convicted on all three counts. Mara Hindley was convicted on two counts of murder and of assisting an offender. Ian knew exactly that what he was doing was wrong and that is actually what made him feel superior to everyone else. And he's very proud of the fact that he chose to follow his desires rather than to conform to what society would expect and want. This is a man that luckily remained behind bars for his entire life because this was a man that was incredibly dangerous who would have gone on to kill again. They're just psychos. They're just killers. They're child killers, that's all they are. And as child killers, they should be forgotten. They should be locked up and left. In 1967, less than one year after conviction, Ian Brady began to show signs of mental distress, hearing voices, hallucinations, believing that he was being spied upon and showing increasing signs of paranoia. Both Ian Brady and Myra Hindley struggled with prison life. They struggled with being apart from one another. The relationship between Brady and Hindley is clearly profoundly disturbing, because it was probably through that relationship that they enabled each other to commit the murders. It was deep and profound and affectionate in their own way. After they were both sent to prison, the love affair continued. They were in separate jails, of course, but they wrote to each other long four-page letters. He would call her Hesse, she would write to him, calling him Dearest Ian. My name's Emma Beach, and I'm a graphologist, a handwriting analyst. I can ascertain someone's personality and characteristics through their handwriting. The spaces around the letter, so the margins, are very, very small, which means that he has a real need to be in charge of any situation. He's not somebody who needs or wants or even could cope with being alone for very long, and he would dominate any situation. I'm only interested in the handwriting, and indeed most of my work is um, looking at samples of handwriting blind, I don't get to meet the person. 
I can really see what motivates them, what their feelings, their desires, their emotions, as well as their physical and sexual motivations. The lower zone of the handwriting is about energy levels, physicality, but it can also point to sexuality. So the whole sexuality aspect of his personality was important to him. Although his lower zones are very long, there are a lack of curves in them, which means that his sexuality would again be based on control and not emotion. Emotion he would be frightened of almost in every aspect of his life. Prison was a very uncomfortable experience for Ian Brady, and this probably accounts for the complete breakdown of his mental faculties. He became very internalised, and, and things became very difficult for him. Brady did go mad in prison, did become disturbed, but that's likely to be the way he was held in solitary confinement for most of the time. So one of the psychiatrists who met him said, well, he wasn't insane to begin with, but he probably is now. He still tried to be in control when a group of gangsters discovered that one of them was in a cell under him and they tried to give him a bad time by shouting things at him and banging on his cell. He simply stayed up the whole of the following night and banged with a broomstick on the ceiling of the cell below so that the man below got no sleep that night. The relationship with Brady persisted for some time after they'd gone into prison. They applied to get married because they thought that then they would be allowed conjugal visits. They wanted to see each other. They very much wanted to still be a team. But towards the end of their relationship, she actually had a friend writing the replies back. They made fun of it. They had a joke. But eventually, she stopped writing. He said, do you want to finish with me? And she said, yes, she did want to finish with him. And she broke off with him. And that meant that he began to turn his vitriol towards her. The control he had over Myra Hindley, obviously he wanted to continue that in jail. It was only when she then rejected him finally, in I think probably a bid to get her, her freedom, that then he started to use the power he had over her in terms of what he knew about her involvement in the murders to then make it impossible, essentially, for her to ever uh, leave jail as well. This was a person that had already ruined other people's lives, but he wanted to continue doing so, e even from prison. These desires, these needs, they come from some kind of deficit within a person. He became very vindictive, and the only power he had when he was able to have visitors, he would have journalists visit him, and he'd start leaking stories about her. He would write letters to people about her. He started poisoning any relationship he'd had with Myra Hindley by making her seem far more involved with the crimes than she probably had been. He turned against her. He was a formidable enemy. Brady's diagnosis was paranoid schizophrenia, narcissistic personality disorder, but he also definitely meets the criteria for antisocial personality disorder. However, for me, I think it was more about personality disorder than mental illness. According to Ian Brady in later life, he believed that life in a psychiatric hospital would be easier than life in a high security prison, and that he'd been faking symptoms of mental illness in order to be moved to Broadmoor or some other such hospital. I'm Tony Thompson. I am a retired director of practice development at the forensic services in the high secure service of Ashworth Hospital. Ashworth is one of the high secure hospitals in the UK. The others being, of course, Broadmoor, Rampton, and Carstairs in Lanarkshire in Scotland. Whether Brady um, faked being mentally ill in order to be transferred to uh, a hospital environment, we, I don't think anyone would ever would ever know. And, and the fact that Brady was considered to be a, a psychopath, then, of course, everything was, was possible. This prison governor said to me, he felt that the aftermath of the public outcry of 
capital punishment being terminated by the then Labour government, that he benefited from that greatly and saw the opportunity, and I quote, to be what was called nutted off prison slang for someone who would be transferred from prison into what might have been thought to be a much more sedate, more comfortable environment within the then special hospitals. So would imagine that someone like Brady would not perhaps have found that it was going to be a relatively comfortable move and would probably be quite surprised when they entered that environment to realise the intensity of the type of, of security that was going to be on them. But Brady was not prepared to participate in, in any form of rehabilitation. He was quite vociferous about that. And I re reflect on a, a senior colleague of mine who had a, a, a lot to do with, with Brady in relation to Brady's complaints. And he described him as a protagonist. And I think when you look at the theatre of the and the drama associated sometimes within high secure care, it that is a very, very apt description. He was a protagonist in his own drama, in his own theatre. And everyone else, including carers, including nurses, therapists, psychiatrists, everyone else, they were just walk-on parts. They were just stand-ins. That's how he seemed to, you know, to be wanted to be portrayed. I was a detective inspector at the time, working in the serious crime squad uh, in Manchester. The head of CID at the day was uh, a guy called Peter Topping, detective chief superintendent, and he had taken the decision to undertake a review of the Moores case because of the two missing children. Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett, really post the 1966 conviction, were just missing person cases. They, they had never uh, been connected directly with Brady and Hindley. This all changed in the 1980s when a journalist managed to wheedle his way in to see Brady and he then put out a piece in the Today newspaper of the day saying that Brady had confessed. I think probably his idea of a confession and everybody else's were, was not quite the same. I, I think he suggested it was just silence. Uh, Brady didn't say he hadn't done them, so that was good enough. We recovered all the, the documents from the original inquiry, which were held by Cheshire Police, and we spent months going through all this paperwork. I think we were all pretty content that there was certainly strong suspicion that Brady and Hindley uh, were involved in the disappearance of these two children. The police believe at least one young victim of the Moors murderers may still be buried here on bleak Saddleworth Moor just outside Manchester. Originally, the police believed any trace of the bodies would have disappeared so many years after the children went missing. But now they've been told there is a chance that the peat in this moorland could have preserved any bodies that were buried here. Our motivation was to go to see Hindley, let Brady know that we had seen Hindley, and let him sit there stewing, thinking that Hindley might have told us something. To our amazement, complete surprise, uh, she actually did tell us something. There were times when Hindley cooperated with the authorities. From prison, she agreed to return to Saddleworth Moor to help police look for the bodies of her victims. I got down on one knee with an archaeological trowel, a pointing trowel, and almost instantly found a white stiletto shoe. And of course, we knew that Pauline Reed was wearing a white stiletto shoe at the time she disappeared. When we found the body of Pauline Reed, Peter went to see Brady and told him that there'd been developments and we found human remains. Uh, and that the chances were they were they were Pauline Reed, and he immediately insisted that he be taken to Saddleworth Moor, where he would point out the remaining grave, that of Keith Bennett. We took him back there a few days later, and he walked down Hograin towards Shiny Brook. I hope he's found. I hope they find him so I can bury him.
We went in the early hours of the morning simply to try to avoid the press. This whole inquiry had a very, very high uh, media profile. He would have known how to raise awareness of himself within the confines of a, of a secure environment. And so therefore he would have known and did know that when to push the buttons that would either produce a media interest or would follow a media interest. Brady taken to and from Park Lane Special Hospital was in this high-speed police convoy. It had started out in the early hours as a secret operation, but by lunchtime, confirmation came from the Home Office and from these pictures that Brady was back on the moors. Once he got there, he strode off very purposefully. I remember that. We were all racing behind him to keep up with him. But when he got there, he couldn't get his bearings. He was talking about things having been moved and, and what have you. To, I mean, it, it hadn't. If we look at the imagery from the 1960s, very little has changed up there. His attempt wasn't a genuine effort to help the police, but there's two possibilities here. One is that he wanted the attention back on himself because it was, it was all on Myra. And there is the possibility that he was going back there to kind of have a look and absorb Keith's grave for one last time. He was trying to run the show right from the word go. That's how he's always done things. He likes to be the media man. I'm in charge. And he's got that ace card knowing exactly where Keith is. He's taunted every one of the families with it, but more so the Bennett family. Seeing someone like Winnie Johnson distraught and crying and wanting to just have that peace of mind to know where, where her son was, I think that was feeding into him gaining compensation for what he had been through. Any normal person receiving a letter from a mum begging to know where her son's body is would absolutely crucify them. Even many offenders wouldn't be able to deal with that. But we're not talking about a normal person here. We're talking about somebody who feels no empathy, has absolutely no remorse. So those letters wouldn't have meant anything to him apart from the fact that he was still in control. This wasn't just about getting back at the children, but it was also about making mothers suffer. I believe he had anger at his mother, and whether he actually showed that or ever expressed that to her, I don't know, but he was certainly expressing anger at motherhood as part of these crimes. Ian's reaction supports my, my feeling that he is more than a psychopath. We've seen psychopaths have remorse and you know, kind of reside to the fact that they've been caught and the best thing now would be to help the families come to peace with what's happened. That's not something Ian can bring himself to do because to him that would be handing over the power that he's worked so hard to get. It would make all his hard work um, seem in vain. Keith Bennett's body still hasn't been discovered. And in one final, last attempt at control, Ian Brady wanted to take his own life. He wanted to be the one that determined when his life ended. And that was his longest running battle. He wanted people to say, ah, oh, look at him, grey hair, old man, and should let him go to wherever he wants to go. This is what he's trying to put over to the, uh, to the public, but the public's not going to wear that. When I was writing to Brady, there was one curious phrase he used. He said, I have no future. I only, only have, have the present, present and, and the past, past, which is why I'm happy to answer your questions. The first thing that I see is the extreme regularity of the handwriting. There's regularity in the slant, which is very far to the right, which shows his need, in fact, his obsession with communication but also regularity of size and the spaces between the letters and the words. 
Everything about this handwriting screams out order and control. He's also got very tall upper zone strokes, which you can see on letters such as H and F and T. There's almost a religious, idealistic way of looking at life, which actually goes into the fantasy, which could explain some of his sexual behavior. But everything that he does is all about pre-planning and very much him in charge and in control. It's chilling to see how regular his handwriting is and how little it changes throughout the years. The letters Brady writes to people, he is manipulating the way we see him, which is exactly what he's done throughout his whole life. He's manipulated people to get what he wants and to, to remain in power and in control of how people see him. The signature here, there was a pride to his name, of how he felt about it, whereas the Ian is much more um, illegible and it shows self-protection, defensiveness. So what he was born with is perhaps not something that he wants to dwell on, whereas what he became is something that he felt as though he should be proud of. If I didn't know that they were written by Ian Brady, I would not say this has been, has been written by a killer. Today marked the start of the serial killer's efforts to be declared sane. In order to be transferred out of the high security Ashworth Hospital, he wants to be transferred to prison where, in his words, he can end his life in his own way. I'm Jeremy Coyd. So I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I'm Emeritus Professor of Forensic Psychiatry at St Bartholomew's in the Royal London School of Medicine. Whilst Brady was in Ashworth Hospital, I was called in to see him by his solicitor to determine whether he was mentally competent to make a decision to have a public mental health review tribunal. There was a question about his mental state as to whether he was mentally ill. He, of course, is a fascinating patient to see because he's so exceptional and unusual and has such a generally negative effect on colleagues, the police, the public, and indeed is notorious. He seemed exceptionally good at controlling me, um, if I let him. You're not supposed to either like or dislike your patients or people you interview, but actually he did produce in me uh, a feeling of intense dislike. I was sitting in, actually it was a large day room, in fact, there were no other patients there, and I was uh, shown in there by a nurse and he was brought to see me. He was clearly past his best in terms of his physical appearance. He was still, at the time I saw him, in fairly good health. He was smoking heavily. He was smoking in a room with very clear signs of uh, that he were not to smoke. There, was no, uh, there were no ashtrays. And he just merely flicked the ash onto the carpet. He looked a bit like a, a shabby, Oxford Don. He was in a pair of grey flannels um, and a brown tweed sports jacket. His general demeanour was to effectively be my professor rather than me his and give me a lecture, particularly on how dreadful Ashworth Hospital was and how particularly awful his consultant psychiatrist caring for him at that time was and how everybody was wrong and everything was wrong and how badly he had been treated. But he's also able to be charming, not to psychiatrists or police officers, but some people, lay people, who visit him have found him most charming. The issue I was going to see him for was to, as to whether he was uh, mentally abnormal in the sense of being paranoid and, and psychotic 
which was the general feeling of, of those who'd looked after him. But actually it was subtle in the sense that what I saw was somebody with a very severe personality disorder. Essentially I was interviewing a psychopath. But there was an issue about his egocentricity. This was somebody who was so self-absorbed. You felt that you were in the presence of an egomaniac. Um, and I, I'm sorry, that is not a psychiatric term. It's a, any longer, it's, it's more a lay term. But it was quite exceptional. So in terms of the question of was he obviously mentally ill? No, he wasn't. But he was very mentally abnormal in the sense of his abnormal personality. It's judgment that Ian Brady will remain at Ashworth Hospital is consistent with the evidence that our expert clinicians gave. This means Ian Brady will remain in the right place to receive the right treatment by the right people. Good riddance, he's gone. I don't drink, but I'll have a pint. I will have a pint. Oh, he's gone. You know. He refused to apologise until the end. He said, why should I? And to whose benefit would it be? No, no remorse. I think by refusing to reveal where Keith Bennett was buried, that was the last bit of control that he refused to give up. But he would never relinquish all control. Whether Ian Brady ever intended to reveal the location of his young victim's grave, we will never know now. Many believe he was simply enjoying the power that that knowledge gave him, playing games with the police. I believe Ian did know where Keith was buried. He was very meticulous in his planning. That's one reason why he took these photos of the burial spots, because he liked to re-experience it and look over it. He took pride in each and every one of the murders, and he would know where they all were. He continued even to the time that he died, indicating or implying that he knew where Keith Bennett's grave was. I'm absolutely 100% satisfied. He didn't know where it was. Had he known where it was, he would have told us, I'm sure. Brady never gave any excuses for his crimes. By giving excuses, he would be admitting that somebody had authority over him. And each man, each person, is responsible for creating their own meaning in life without any debt or reference to other people. It's the relation between Ian Brady and Mara Hindley takes you to the heart of darkness. How was it that these two people, who psychiatrists said were resolutely normal, how was it they come together to commit acts of such horror? One of the arguments you're led to is it was some way of facilitating each other, encouraging each other in breaking the bounds of convention and going as far as they did into unconventional and criminal behavior. I think there's something in that. There's something in the idea it was a folly ardeur, a collective madness between the two. At bottom, it still doesn't explain why you should indulge in such sickening and repulsive horror. I think Brady had a very diseased brain. Something had happened. Something in his biology, I think, was different. Something in his environment had led to this. But he had free will, he, had, he, had, he could make choices about the things that he did. And, and I think even when somebody is that, there's that level of disorder in the brain, we do have to some, some kind of control of what we do. So I, I think he must have come to a point when he made that decision to go down a certain path. We sit here, including myself in this, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, we all sit here and talk about what caused it. Sometimes we just don't know sometimes. And even though I've said he's not a psychopath, he's more than a psychopath. He's created his own new evil. I think the only valid use of the word evil is to describe how these people behave and use the term evil as a touchstone to try to grapple with the enormity of what they did. Absolute evil, yes. No redeeming features, yes. 
murdering small children, torturing them, sexually abusing them. It's hard to think of anything more merits the word evil than that, but even the word evil in that case doesn't get you to why they did it. <laughs>